Feliciteren de Mythbusters met hun eredoctoraat. All right, here we go. This is for Lori. Excited Mythbusters. <laughs> yeah! Despite the protest from the tires, the bus made the turn. But just like the movie, only just. Oh, I cannot even tell you what an adrenaline rush that is. are the inevitable subsequent lows. I know I'm a myth buster, but I'm a little sad to find out that the trick is so easy. Kids, welcome to the University of Clemson. My name is Stefano Stramizoli and I'm professor of robotics at this university. It's my great pleasure to have you all here, but of course to have the Mythbuster. I'm the, what is called the honorary promoter of the Mythbuster. And unfortunately, Jamie cannot be here, but we are very happy to have Adam here. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam. so much for the warm welcome. I, I'm humbled to be here among all of you guys. I've flown halfway, maybe a third of the way across the world, across the planet. Um, you know, in uh, the spring of 2002, I was a special effects technician working on one of the sequels to The Matrix, hoping it would be good. Uh, and I got a call from a colleague of mine, Jamie Heineman, saying that he had been approached by the Discovery Channel to do this little show called Mythbusters. Uh, it sounded like a terrible name to me, but it was an interesting idea. And uh, he said they would like to see a demo reel. I said, I could come in next week. He said, no, actually, they really want to see a demo reel by Friday. So I went into his shop the next day. I took the day off work, and I took a couple of video cameras. And we shot uh, for about an hour and a half. What's funny about that video is that uh, uh, Discovery loved it the moment they got it. The production company loved it. The camera crew showed up three weeks later and we started filming Mythbusters in the summer of 2002. And we have pretty much never stopped filming Mythbusters. Uh, we shoot 215 days a year for the last nine years. Uh, and if you watch that original demo reel, it's actually sort of indistinguishable from, from the show that you see now. In it, uh, I annoy Jamie. Uh, we light something on fire, we blow it up, we run away from it. We come back, we put it out. It actually, the explosions weren't something that we had planned to put in the show, except that in one of the pilots we blew something up, and so the first network, we, network note we got was, this is great, we're going to order 13 episodes, and we want you to blow something up in every single one. Uh, somewhere in the middle of that first season, which was working six days a week, 12 hours a day, uh, we all almost died because we were so tired, but we were doing a myth about throwing a penny off the Empire State Building. And if you throw a penny off an extremely high building, it can kill you when it hits the ground. So of course, 
The soul of this story is how fast can a penny fall through the air? What is a penny's terminal velocity? And it turns out that a penny has two terminal velocities. It has one terminal velocity when it's on its face, and it has another one when it's on its edge. And we had some lovely complicated math that had been done by a NASA scientist who had tried this out and had done the, the figures for us. And we traveled to film another interview, and on our way back on the plane, I was thinking about this. This is really only about four months in. I'm not even sure Mythbusters had aired at this point. We were still filming the first episodes. But I was thinking, it doesn't seem like it's enough to me that we just have this math that describes that a penny falls at, uh, you know, 50 kilometers per hour at this, uh, in this orientation and 90 kilometers per hour at this orientation. I wanted something more than that, and I thought, you know, maybe I could build, maybe I could show rather than tell. That seems to be what we want to do because it's television. So maybe I can design a wind tunnel that can do this. So I went back to the shop and I took a clear plexiglass tube and drilled holes in it and put a huge fan underneath. The idea was that the holes would let some of the airspeed out as it was going up. Uh, and with the addition of a tongue depressor across the top, it worked exactly like that. I was able to get the, the high wind speed at the bottom and the low wind speed at the top. And low, when I put a penny in it, it tumbled up and down. It did exactly what I expected it to do. And this was the moment that I credit with the first time I sort of started to understand what my, what my job was. And it was also the moment that I realized that that I might be able to contribute something to this show. That this was an idea that was mine. It was a, 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 a thing, an, an, an addition to the understanding of a penny that was physical, it was visceral. It's how I understand things. It's how I have to understand things. I can read them and I can look at the math and I can parse it, but I have to do it. I have to get my hands dirty. And every great machinist, engineer, scientist will tell you that only when you understand something on a physical level, when you understand it with your body, do you really fully understand it. Over the years, I have collected stories of exactly that type of physicalization of the science, because to me it is the most, it's the most rewarding part about doing this show. Uh, we really don't know what's going to happen most of the time. I will tell you, we just did a myth a couple of weeks ago from the Pirates of the Caribbean, in which uh, in the second movie, some pirates are, are captured in a bone cage and they have to swing the cage over the side of a ravine and catch it and climb to safety. Um, I, I'm not going to reveal to you exactly how the story went, but we made very clear assumptions about all three of the things that are done. The swinging, the catching, and the climbing. And we were wrong about two out of three of them. We were 100% wrong about two out of three of them. And that to us is one, some of the best days on the show when we are completely wrong. In, when he was a young boy, uh, the American physicist Richard Feynman was walking down the street in Queens, New York with his father and he was pulling a wagon with a ball. And he noticed that when he pulled the wagon, the ball went to the back of the wagon. Pulled the wagon, the ball went to the back and he said to his dad, what is, what is that that's happening? And his dad said, that's inertia. And he said, what's inertia? And his dad said, ah, inertia is the name that scientists give to the phenomenon of the ball moving to the back of the wagon. <laughs> but in truth, he said, nobody really knows. And Feynman went on to earn degrees from MIT, uh, Princeton. He worked on the Manhattan Project. He taught at Caltech for many years. He won a Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking work in, in, in physics with his Feynman diagrams. And he says that this moment with his father was the moment that taught him that the simplest questions could carry you right out to the edge of possible knowledge. Uh, Eratosthenes was the third librarian at the Great Library of Alexandria. And he received a letter that had in it a fact that stuck out to him. Uh, the fact in the letter was that the, the writer said that on the, on the noon, on noon, excuse me, the writer said that at noon on the solstice, he had looked down a well in his town. He lived in a town called Swenet, which is about 500 miles south of uh, Alexandria. He had looked down a well and he could see his, his uh, reflection at the bottom of the well. 
and he could also see that his head was blocking the sun. Eratosthenes, this fact stuck out to him. I, you should, it should be noted, and it's an oft-quoted myth in the United States, that Christopher Columbus somehow discovered that the Earth was spherical, which is not the case at all. Um, every educated person at that point already knew that the Earth was spherical. They had known it since Aristotle had proven it by simply noting that uh, if the Earth always cast a circular shadow on the moon, it must be a sphere. So Eratosthenes was, Eratosthenes was well versed in the idea that the Earth was a sphere, but nobody knew how big it was until he saw this letter and saw this fact. The fact said that at noon on the solstice, the sun was directly overhead the city of Swenet. Eratosthenes knew that at noon on the solstice, in Alexandria, the sun was 7.2 degrees off axis. A stick in the ground would show that, 7.2 degrees off axis. So if you know the circumference of a circle, and you know 0 and 7.2 degrees, what's 100, 360 degrees divided by 7.2 actually equals 50, and it's a nice neat number which is a little suspicious, but it's a good story, so we're going to keep going with it. Now all you need to do is multiply the distance between those two cities by 50, and you should come out with a circumference. And it turns out that the distance between Swenet and Alexandria was a well-known distance. These were two cities of commerce. Business needs to know how far things are away, how long it takes to get there. And because it was so well-traveled, he knew the distance was roughly 500 miles. Thus, he was able to calculate the circumference of the Earth as 25,000 miles. He was off by about 2.5%, 2,200 years ago. And he did this with a letter. I love that. And we live in an age where the Large Hadron Collider is about to crack apart the Higgs boson, where neutrinos might be traveling faster than light, or, or not. Uh, and we think that it's easy to think as young as students in science that everything's been discovered, but the thing you need to know is that everybody throughout all of recorded history has felt like that. Everything's already been discovered. Everybody lives in an age where they think they're smarter people than me and they've already got it all figured out. And the fact is that is not the case. And it's beautiful when you start getting out to the edge of things and understanding how early we as people started to really understand the shape of the world and the shape of the universe. Armand Fizeau was an experimental physicist in Paris in the mid-19th century. And his specialty was replicating and refining the experiments of others, which may sound uh, slightly quotidian. In fact, this is the soul of science, is confirming results. Nothing is a fact until it's been independently corroborated. Uh, and he he was uh, familiar with an experiment by Galileo. Galileo had tried to do some experiments into the speed of light. His experiment seems quaint to us now, but uh, it was genuine. He, he decided to see if light had a speed. Maybe he could discern it by flashing a lamp at his assistant. So he and his assistant stood in front of each other right here, and they got very good at the timing. Galileo would open his lamp, and his assistant would open his lamp, and they would get their timing really, really tight, and then they moved to hilltops about two miles distant and tried the same thing. The theory was, was that if there was a speed to the light, there'd be a delay in the flash coming back from his assistant. But the speed of light was too fast for Galileo. Um, he was about a thousand times off his estimate of its speed. But Fizeau thought about this experiment of the burst of light, of the pulse of light, and he ended up refining Galileo's experiment and perfecting it with nothing more than a, a toothed wheel. So I want you to try and picture this in your head because understanding it is something that gave me great pleasure the first time I read it. So picture a wheel. Uh, this, his wheel was actually quite large. It had 720 teeth around the perimeter. And so it's a toothed wheel. So there is a tooth and there's a notch. And then there's a tooth and then there's a notch. So let's think about this wheel while it's stationary. I shine a light through one of those notches, and I reflect it back to myself in a mirror. And you can understand clearly that the beam of light you're seeing is going through the notch, through the mirror, and coming right back to your eye. He had a beam, slither, beam splitter, so he was able to look directly down the beam. Now if I move that wheel, I'm going to talk to the young kids here because I really want you to get this. If you move that wheel one notch, the, the light will flash to you. You'll be looking at it through the next notch. So you start to spin this wheel. The light being reflected back to you begins to pulse. 
it begins to pulse. Now, Fizeau was doing this with two towers that were five miles apart in Paris. And as he began to spin this wheel up, he started to notice the reflection from the mirror that was coming back to him started to become occluded. It looked almost to his eye like a door was closing. Now remember, actually, also you should know, determining the speed of light with a laser and some electronics is a, re is a very common early physics experiment for college students. But Fizeau had to construct this experiment so that he could see it with his eye. This was the threshold we had until maybe 75 years ago. We didn't have counting equipment, we didn't have electronics. The eye was what had to notice this. So he starts to see the wheel is spinning and the door seems to be closing on the light. What is happening is really amazing. He's pulsing a light through the toothed wheel and as he spins it up fast enough, the beam is reflecting off the mirror and it's not making it back in time. It's actually hitting the tooth of the next, of the next tooth. And eventually, as he spins the wheel fast enough, he fully includes the light. He's spinning this wheel, and he can no longer see the reflection in the mirror. Then, based on the math of the circumference of his wheel, how fast it's spinning, how far away his mirror is, he calculates the speed of light to within 2% of its actual number in 1849. And this, this, is, this is what thrills me as the gentleman scientist that I am without any proper accreditation. Is that when you look at the people that have discovered what they discovered, and, and I do this actually whenever I have a difficulty understanding a concept, I actually go back and I read about the people that first came up with it and their first experiments into it. Because it helps me get that clarity. When you look at the discoverers and what they discovered, you see that they're not so different from us. They're, we are all bags of flesh and water trying to answer questions. And these people are just people that ask these questions a little more precisely. They thought about it a little more with a little more obsession. And in doing so, they cracked apart nature and started to look inside and see how beautiful it is. And by doing that, they actually changed the world. And so can you. Thank you. Inspiration we need. Now, he can, the floor is yours, we'll, I will ask for some questions, we'll have some time for some questions. Thanks a lot, Anne. Yes, welcome everybody. I uh, hope everybody's English was as good as they imagined, because normally you see MedBusters with subtitling. Um, I know there are a lot of people who have questions, so uh, I'm going to walk through the room, uh, raise your hand when I'm near, and I'll repeat the questions so Adam can answer them. Adam, what's your name? Christian asks if you ever busted a Dutch myth. Busted a Dutch myth. The boy with his finger in the dike? I, we have not done it. No. <laughs> the question maybe you do did you bring your head and can I have it <laughs> my hat oh your hat my hat oh not your head uh, no you can't have my hat <laughs> um, you know I've been doing this show so long I now have um, five of those hats <laughs> uh, they get beat up and I have them lined up like trophies in my man cave in uh, San Francisco. <laughs> and no, they're, they're, I, I may donate one to charity someday. Another question from? How is your out of work relationship? How is your out of work relationship with Jamie? Um, my out of work relationship with Jamie is very interesting. Um, we, don't, we don't like each other. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding at all. We drive each other we annoy the crap out of each other every day. I can't stand to listen to him talk. 
He can't stand to hear me go on. Um, that being said, we have a tremendous amount of respect for each other, and it is there's a strength in that respect and in the dislike. Number one, we're not afraid to say something that'll hurt the other's feelings because we don't care. <laughs> and while we both have healthy egos, to be sure, we are we consider it a point of pride that the right idea always wins. It doesn't matter whose it is. And there's a bunch of times in the history of the show that neither of us could tell you who came up with the perfect solution for the thing. It just happened. So, you know, I'll say, why don't we do it A to B? And he'll say B to A. And I'll say A to C. And he'll say C to A. And we'll just argue back and forth. And at a certain point, somebody will go, well, one of us will say, we well, just put a ladder up to it. And we'll go, oh, right. That's exactly right. That's how we're going to do it. Um, and so I, every great partnership that I know, the magicians Penn and Teller are friends of ours. Uh, I have a couple of friends that, that, that produce the show Big Bang Theory in, in uh, in the United States, and both of those, all three of these partnerships that I know of are, are based in conflict. There's, there's no people who work together constantly that aren't in regular conflict, but there's a strength and an integrity to that conflict. It, it, the integrity is that your own idea always has to be checked against somebody else's. It's, it's got to be corroborated, and if you think that it's the best, you better fight for it being the best because you know that it is. And it really yields, unfortunately, much better results when we work together than when we work alone. I've got another question here. What's your name? Danny. Danny. <laughs> Did you ever notice that you're the funny one of the two of you? Uh, if Jamie was standing here, I'd be twice as funny. <laughs> Yes, no, the, I, I took that on really early. You know, I realized that some of my favorite performers are comedians, and that a good comedian knows that being humiliated is the soul of comedy, so I have been naked on national, international television. I've contributed every bodily fluid that I can think of to this show. Um, I've been hurt, I've been bounced, I've been burned, and I love it. I. I also realize there's something universal in that. I mean, you know, my the source of my funniness comes from a deep felt desire to get it. I wear those costumes not because of the show. I actually owned all those costumes before we filmed the show. <laughs> I'm just excited to have an excuse other than wandering around the house while my wife isn't home to wear them. So it's genuine. It's a, it's you know, and I recognize that's funny and weird and. Why not? Let's let's make let's show me being funny and weird because everybody is and there's a universality to that. I've got another question here. Does it bother you at all that uh, producers might cut out scenes that you uh, might want to view, uh, show on television? Absolutely. Um, I'll tell you, it's much worse in the United States where we have an extra. You guys see a Mythbusters that's 52 or 53 minutes long? Uh, that's the cut that I see, the rough cut. But in the U.S., they cut out eight minutes. We get 44 minutes long. Um, and I don't know who does the cutting, but they seem to have a special penchant for removing the punchlines to my jokes. <laughs> um, also, at times, entire experiments will be missing. The, that's actually one of the places where the growth of the, of the World Wide Web and the Internet has really aided Mythbusters, because uh, if those if those segments get cut out, they show up on the web, and we'll you know we have a forum for people to be able to see stuff. Another question at the front. I think they are your super friends in here. What's your name? Did you all understand that? Yeah, I, I had an accident with a, uh, with a, uh, trying to set fire to a cubic foot of gasoline and it ended up burning my eyebrow off the night before a date. Um, what I find most funny about this is also sort of, you know, I'm laughing hysterically and I'm saying, am I missing an eyebrow? And it's been used in the opening credits for a, you know, a million years. But uh, if you watch the whole segment, I'm going, <laughs> am I missing my eyebrow? And Jamie goes, yeah, and half of your hair. And I go, what? <laughs> I lose all my good humor. 
It wasn't as bad as that. Um, in fact, I nearly singed my eyebrows so that it was just, I smelled a little like burnt hair for a couple of days. It wasn't that bad. I see someone at the back. I'll go a little closer. Does every but every man need his own cave? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I didn't call it I've always had a shop. I've always had a place for my stuff. I have a lot of stuff. Um, I'm a high functioning hoarder. <laughs> which means that I can afford storage spaces for all the crap that I have. Um, and recently my wife and I moved into a section of San Francisco where there's all, pretty much no parking at all. And we have one garage space and we had to use it for a car, unfortunately. And I, I, was, I, was, I did without a shop for a couple of months and my wife pointed out, you know, we could rent you a space around the corner. There's, this, is, this is an industrial district, there's a lot of spaces, and so I rented an auto shop around the corner. And around the same time I met the director Guillermo del Toro who has since become a, a very good friend of mine. And when I first met him, he's, the first thing he said to me was, Call me up! Come to my man cave! <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, wow, yes! So uh, two weeks later, I flew down to Los Angeles, and his man cave is, it's actually, he calls it Bleak House. And it is a Victorian mansion, I'm not kidding you, that nobody lives in. It is merely for his intensely large collection, a mansion-sized collection of weird stuff. And it's like, you know, uh, Frankenstein busts and original artwork and paintings and sculptures and esoterica, you know, Rosicrucian artifacts and papal rings. I mean, there's every manner of weird stuff in there. And I realize I have a very similar collection. I'm looking through like, yeah, I got one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those. Uh, yours, that one, that, that's not a good one. I'll send you a better one. So we started trading. We started trading stuff back and forth. And I realized now that, now that we are each other's patron, as it were, uh, it does make sense to call my shop the man cave. So I, I, I separated it out from a shop to a, a sort of sitting area, which is just an absolute, I, my, I'm most pleased when I'm kind of overwhelmed by my stuff. So you walk in and there's just too much to look at that's when I'm really happy and start to relax. And my wife is so happy that that's not in the house. <laughs> I can't even tell you. So yeah, every man should have his own man here. I've got one more question here. Can, can you talk a little bit slower? <laughs> Is there a lot of research done before you shoot the show? Um, absolutely, there's a lot of research that goes into every episode. Sometimes it's relatively simple, like this one we just did for Pirates of the Caribbean. We didn't need to do a tremendous amount of research because we just needed to build a cage and make it the correct size. Um, we got some trapeze artists to help us instead of pirates, figuring that their ability to move would be a, a, a resource we could count on. But um, I'll give you a great example. We did a myth a few years ago called Swimming in Syrup, which I knew we had to do the moment I heard that title. I, as my idea, I'd read about this study that these scientists in the Midwest of the United States had done where uh, they had a pool full of syrup. And the myth is that you could swim just as fast in syrup as you can in water. Because while the thicker material slows down your forward momentum, it gives you more to push off of. And those two forces cancel out, and someone swimming in syrup would swim just as fast as someone swimming in water. And the moment I hear that, I actually think of myths like jokes. I always, I always start with knowing what the punchline is. And I knew the punchline of this myth was me and Jamie in adjacent pools, like 100 feet long, swimming against each other, one of us in syrup and one of us in water. Um, and then we started to, so, you know, you start to do the research that it takes to look into something like that. Like, okay, well, obviously, if I'm going to do syrup, we need to quantify what syrup is. So you need to quantify viscosity. I actually found this organization in the U.S. that's literally like the, 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 the National Society of 
what do they call it? Um, God, I'll have to remember the name of somebody who studies viscosity has a certain scientific name, and they have a they they have a scientific organization. So I called up the president of the organization and I said, "How do I quantify viscosity for the serps that I want to play with?" And he started getting really mad at me because the structure of my question was entirely wrong. <laughs> and this happens all the time on the show: is we want to give an absolute value to something. You know that something's thick. You pour syrup. You pour motor oil. They have a thickness that you can see. So you think that they have a value that you could quantify, but they don't. It turns out viscosity isn't a value given to things for their, vis for their thickness. It's actually a relationship between that thing and the medium that it's going through. So viscosity is affected by temperature, by speed, by all these factors, by the vessel that it's even pouring out of. So we, we weren't going to be able to do this episode going, this syrup is X thickness and this is Y thickness. We actually had to become much more plastic about it. And in that episode, as we were doing the research and as we got the syrup and we got the material and we built the pools, that is an episode in which the plot of the episode changed every single day. Because every day, every experiment we did came to a different result than we expected. Um, and at the end, actually, we thought, okay, for the finale of this episode, we want a swimmer who is a perfect constant. We want someone who swims for a living. So we got this Olympic gold medalist, Nathan Adrian, who's about 19 feet tall and seven feet wide, and wears his medals when you ask him. He's just a beautiful specimen of humanity. And we, we gave him this pool to swim in. At first he gets in and he's like, oh my god, and it's cold water. So we've been swimming in cold water all week, but that's not what he does. He swims in warm water. And then we didn't put a line on the, well, also, he swam 70 feet without lifting his head out of the water. <laughs> it was amazing. It took him like three strokes. Um, <laughs> and then we put him in the syrup, and he started pinballing off the walls. He, he kept on smacking into the walls, and we realized, actually, that because he's so specialized, he swims with his head down, following a black line at the bottom of a warm pool. That is what he does, and he's one of the best people in the world at it. But put him in milky syrup, and he's helpless. <laughs> My time swimming in syrup was about as fast as his time. Which by no rights should it be. I'm terribly out of shape. But what we came to the conclusion at the end was, oh my god, Nathan, we have to throw out your results because you're too much of a, 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 of a specialist. Me, the generalist, actually gives better results swimming in serpent water because I don't have a bias as to how I swim or the medium that I swim in. And to me, that's like we came up right to the end of that episode where all of our research had to be upturned and overturned every single day. It was one of the most difficult and also most fun times we've had on the show. Ellen, I've got three last questions for you. The first here from Bas. What's your favorite tool besides the C4? <laughs> uh, my favorite tool, that's a really good question. Um, there is a, uh, there's a, a machine called a bandsaw. A band of steel travels around two wheels. It was invented for cutting meat. It cuts steel and wood really well. I love the bandsaw, but they, they make a portable one. And actually, they make a battery-powered one. Um, and I don't go anywhere without this. I would make lunch with it if I could. Um, it turns very slowly. It's very hard to hurt yourself with it. It cuts through wood, metal, steel, brick, whatever you want. Uh, and it does it in this just, it's, you know, when you first start making things with steel, the first tool someone gives you is a cutoff saw, which is this abrasive wheel, and it makes the most ungodly, awful, loud noise. It, it hurts everyone in the vicinity, and it shoots sparks and sets things on fire. So the, the difference here, the, the port of man, is it's one of my absolute favorite tools. But probably the thing that I couldn't live without from a desert island perspective would be a multi-tool uh, on my belt. Uh, my favorite is a Leatherman right now. Um, I've been wearing one on my belt for 25 years. And actually, just the other, I was in the hotel room about an hour ago, trying to cut something out of one of my wife's dresses for her. And I immediately did this. Oh, but I've been flying, so I don't have my Leatherman. I've lost a, a half a dozen of them on airplanes over the last few years. Uh, but when I'm in San Francisco, it's just never not on my belt. This young lady, what's your name? Evelyn, what's your question? Ellen, 
how do you find it that there uh, are a lot of young people watching your show and are fan? Yeah, the, the younger audience, it's not something we ever expected. We never set out to be inspirational to kids or to educate them in any way. Um, and I think that's part of the success. I, we don't know what we're doing. We don't have degrees in the science. Um, we are just two guys who are, who are curious. Um, when we look at an experiment, the first experiment that we want to do for every, for every myth is what would two guys alone in their garage, guys or girls, what would two guys or girls alone in their garage on a Sunday afternoon do with this? And that's the first experiment that we do. And the, the, the narrative that each myth takes, where we go off in this direction and go off in that direction, is based on arguments that Jamie and I have early on about what we think is the most important aspect of this story. So I think the fact that... And then the third thing is that most science shows are what I call demonstration shows, where a guy says, oh, here I took the baking soda and put the vinegar in and now you have a volcano. But they don't ever really help you physically understand what's happening. They just explain it. And it's my one complaint with most science programming. We don't know what's happening. It is genuinely an experimentation show. Uh, and therefore, the stuff that's happening, we're learning from it just as the audience is. And I think the kids, they understand it when you're not talking down to them. They appreciate it, and they engage on that level. So we continue to ignore children in our heads as we're filming the show. Um, but you know, the fact that I've gotten emails from PhD engineering uh, graduates who say that they got interested in the field because of Mythbusters, and that's just weird. <laughs> Thanks. One final question here from the center. What's your name? Rob. What was the best fun you ever did on the Mythbusters show? The best fun? Okay, that's a really good question, because fun is a key part of it. Um, I have to say, we did an episode a couple years ago called Water Slide Wipeout. There's an internet video of a guy sliding down this impossibly long slide, flying hundreds of feet through the air and landing in this little pool. And we saw it and we thought, we have to do it, but we don't know how to do it. And then I figured out how we do it. We do it in front of the lake, so that you could miss the target and still not die. <laughs> Not dying is very important, <laughs> part of every experiment. Um, so we set up this, uh, we set up this slide. It was 125 feet long. What is that? 45 meters. And uh, we covered it with slick material. And we got on it and we soaked ourselves down with dish soap. And we slid all the way down, reaching something around 40. What about? 60 kilometers per hour at the bottom, flying through the air and landing in the water. And at the end of the first day, I landed this perfect hit in the water. It was beautiful. My feet first. The water was cold, but, you know, I hit perfectly, like, in a line, and I felt great. I felt actually totally awesome, because Jamie wasn't nearly as good at it as I was. <laughs> He kind of looked like a walrus flying through the air. So on the second day, it was decided I would be the one to do all the final tests. And it required me to do two tests for aiming and then a third test to hit our pool. And the, the first test comes up. I should you know, point out that it's cold. The water we're going in there is this lake, this quarry lake. And it's, it's very, very cold water. So when you hit it, you kind of get an instant water, a headache from the cold. Um, this is compounded by the fact that I was really cocky, and I thought, well, I know how to do this now. So I got on the slide, and I slid down, and I landed slightly off axis, and it really is like, it's like, it's like getting hit with a two-by-four. You get an instant headache, and it's really awful, and you're mad about it because it hurts. And now nothing's fun because you're in pain. But I got to walk back to the top of the slide, and I got to do it again, and the second time I also hit wrong. And now I'm really not having any fun at all. I mean, this thing is so much fun, and I'm not having any of it because I'm hurting. And uh, we had a, whenever we're doing something like that, we have a stunt coordinator, a guy who's a professional stuntman in Hollywood, and he coaches us through doing this stuff. 
He gives us the mental picture of what we're thinking about. He helps us understand what some of the dangers are, the things we want to avoid. And in this case, it was an old friend of mine named Nick Cliche. And Nick comes up to the top. Now it's about to do my, I'm about to do my third run. And we've set this little pool target in the water. And it's, you know, many, 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 many feet from me. I don't know if I'm going to hit it. And I don't even care anymore because I'm really mad. And I hurt. And I'm cold. And Nick says, do I need to tell you anything? No, he says, I want to ask you something. Are you a friggin' stunt man or what? I'm like, and he says, because that's what I tell my guys in LA. I tell all the stunt men I know in LA, Adam is the real deal. He can do anything that you guys can do. He's a genuine, bona fide stunt man, and he can do it. So, Adam, are you going to do it? He says, it's not in here, it's in here. All the stuff happens here. He goes, the only thing I want you thinking about when you hit the water is, does my director want another take? <laughs> and, he, and then he said, I, I'm not exaggerating his dialogue at all. It was totally like a movie. And then he says, I'll see you at the bottom. And he walks down to the bottom. And sure enough, it was the right mix of things to say to my tired, adult, and in pain brain. And in the episode, you can see it. I, I swoop off the slide in this perfect arc with my arms outstretched and my eyes closed. You fly for way longer than you think is humanly possible. And then I feel the water hit my feet and I landed right in the center of our target without even wrecking our target. And it was one of my favorite things I've ever done on the show. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. finished yet. I know if I ask here in the room who wants to take a picture with Adam, I see 1,400. Yeah, I thought so. We have a plan. There are f a few children here with a button on it. Super fan. They can come forth. Jullie mogen naar voren komen. Jullie gaan met Adam op de foto. But there are chances for the rest of you to check your chair. If there is a flyer under your chair, you can come forth with two or three people and take a turn with a picture. Under your chair. Anyone with a flyer under their chair? No one? Flyers? Yeah, I've got one. Are you going to do the picture by yourself or you want to take a friend? Call the next. Maarten Toxopeus, Inge Dos Santos, please come forth for a picture. Who has a flyer? One more. Yes. Okay, when the when the picture is taken, please.
Thank you very much to all of you for being here. Thank you very much to you, Adam. It was great. I really appreciate it. I always like when we talk. It's awesome. So thanks, for, thanks a lot for coming. I hope you enjoy your time. This is a unique opportunity you had, I had. And let's give it a, a round round of applause to, to Adam for his great presentation.